As the battle had tentatively come to an end, I decided to return to the mothership. The flight range of our Type 97 carrier attack bomber was five hours, and we had already flown four and one half hours. By simple calculation, we would not make it to the mothership in another thirty minutes, but we were at war, and I felt somehow that we would return safely. It was 10.30 a.m., I said. Matsuzaki, we will head back, take the return course of ten degrees. And I was still searching for possible targets during our return. We had to hit surviving cruisers and auxiliary ships like destroyers and submarines. But above all else, I felt that it was essential to smash as many oil tanks and shipyard repair facilities as possible. As we were about to leave Oahu, a fighter approached us with a friendly sign, banked and followed us. I asked, whose plane is that? As I looked back, Mizuki, who must have been looking at it for a while, responded, it belongs to Zuikaku. If it was a fighter from the Zuikaku, it belonged to the first attack wave. What a long time the plane has been flying, I thought. Then I thought that it was possible that there were other stray fighters around. Matsuzaki will make one more round to pick up stray kids. It was clear that Matsuzaki was worried about how much fuel we had left for our return, but he could not ignore an order from his commander. That day, the gathering point for returning to pick up stray air fighters was Kahuku Point. The general commander's plane rounded the point and found, as suspected, another stray fighter. I successfully returned to the mothership, leading these two fighters. However, the senior petty officer of maintenance told me, Commander, you had no fuel left. It was a big risk that you did not return earlier. Besides, it was dangerous because the control wire was almost completely severed. I responded, we are at war, it will fly even if the control wire is cut. The maintenance crews listening to the conversation must have thought that the general commander was insane. They were right, I was, in fact, a crazy officer with a burning desire to serve my country. As we touched down on the Akagi, the air crews waiting impatiently for my return rushed to welcome me. I was putting together the report of the battle results in the launch command centre, witnessed by my commanders, including Lieutenant Commander Murata of the Torpedo Bombing Squadron. Moreover, Lieutenant Commander Itaya and Lieutenant Shindo of the Air Superiority Squadrons, Lieutenant Furukawa of the Level Bombing Squadron, and Lieutenant Chihaya of the Dive Bombing Squadron. When there was an urgent and impatient request from the bridge, Commander Fuchida, come to the bridge quickly. I went up to the bridge as I had no choice, leaving the report of the battle results until later. As soon as he saw me, Commander Nagumo abruptly and eagerly asked me, How did the battle go? These were the points that I was just now analysing with my officers. Under the situation, I was able to report only what I myself had seen. Yes, sir, it is certain that four enemy battleships were sunk. The remaining four ships were badly damaged, I believe that they will not be able to mobilise from Pearl Harbour for the time being. I think we have annihilated the enemy's air power. In addition, each airbase was blanketed with fierce black smoke that interfered with my surveillance of the battle area. But due to the fact that not a single enemy plane showed up to counter-attack us during my three hours in the air, I believe that air superiority belongs to us. The enemy anti-aircraft fire reacted much more quickly than expected beginning less than five minutes after the start of our attack. I believe that they were prepared for war. Nagumo, who was nodding keenly as I reported, expressed his appreciation when I finished. Commander, well done. He looked at Chief of Staff Kusaka to inquire if he had anything else he wanted to ask me, to which the Chief of Staff winked at me with a gesture indicating that I should retire and relax. I saluted and returned to the launch command centre. On the flight deck, preparations were taking place for a second repeat attack. The planes that had refuelled and replenished their ammunition were lifted to the deck by elevator and were lined up at their takeoff positions. I was standing by for the next attack, eating a rice dumpling with bean paste, our standard battle food. Real Admiral Taimon Yamaguchi, commander of the Second Aviation Fleet, sent a signal from his flagship, the Soryu, to the Akagi. Soryu and Hiryu are ready for takeoff. This was implicitly a demand to expedite the start of the second attack. The Akagi herself was nearing completion of the work required for her planes to take off. Then, a course signal was raised on the Akagi's mast, 
The signal indicated that we would return on the route we had just followed. I was upset and thought, what stupidity, but the decision belonged to the commander. It would not do any good if I complained. However, it was Kusaka's principle that lions retreat once they have accomplished their attack. It was well known that Kusaka had immersed himself in studies of Zen Buddhism. We teased him about the Zen of self-deception, but he was serious about it. He was so serious that he adopted the lion story as his guiding principle. According to the story, the lion, once having given a full force blow to its enemy, quickly turns to the next enemy without any further thought or consideration and takes a ready-to-pounce position to attack the next target with all its might. This is the principle behind the lion's retreat once they have accomplished their attack. Later, after the attack, Kusaka said that we have now accomplished the purpose of our operation by attacking Pearl Harbor and annihilating the United States Pacific Fleet. Any further attempt to attack oil tanks or repair facilities at the naval shipyard is nothing but the hindsight of fools. The situational judgment of Commander Nagumo to abandon a second wave attack on Pearl Harbor and instead to take the return course of action was as follows. By the first air attack, the original aim has been mostly accomplished. We can hardly expect significant increases in battle achievements if we dare to initiate the second air attack. Even in the first air attack, the enemy defensive fire started quickly, nearly resulting in a no-surprise assault. The second and following air attack will become a pure assault with significant increase in casualties in proportion to the additional expected battle achievements. Judging from the enemy's communications, it is certain that there remain at least 50 large enemy planes. Besides, location and condition of the enemy aircraft carriers, heavy cruisers, submarines and others are not known. On the other hand, in view of the situation in which search beyond 250 nautical miles is difficult for us, as such search is dependent exclusively on the surveillance by advanced groups of submarines, it is disadvantageous to stay so far from our bases in the enemy flight zone. On the basis of the above situational judgment, the task force fleet decided to disengage without making a repeat attack. I was totally against this judgment. The essence of military action is momentum. I thought that this was the exact time to exploit our battle advantage. I could not do anything if the commander decided to return because he was satisfied with the battle results. But if we are returning anyway, why should we take the same course back? I recommended to the commander that we take the central course straight instead, as this might give us an opportunity to encounter two enemy aircraft carriers at sea. However, Commander Nagumo did not have much faith in our search capability. This was certainly one of our mistakes. Back in those days, the heads of Japanese naval aviation downgraded the role and usefulness of surveillance, instead placing importance on attack capabilities. They simply thought that any plane able to fly would be suitable for surveillance as well, and surveillance was regarded as routine practice for any aviator. However, at the outbreak of the Pacific War, this defective reasoning was clearly exposed. Surveillance requires even more skill and is more difficult than fighting, and unless special purpose reconnaissance planes are developed and special training provided, reconnaissance crews with the required capabilities can never be developed. Unfortunately, at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, we were still at the stage where surveillance was not given high priority, and we failed to win the full trust of the commander. And the result was that instead of the central course, we took the same northerly route to return. On December 23, 1941, hereafter, Tokyo time, the Nagumo Task Force fleet returned to Japanese waters. As we entered Bungo Strait, each carrier's squadron landed at the bases where they trained before the mission. I flew to Kagoshima Base, leading the level bombing and torpedo bombing squadrons of the Akagi. As I stepped down from the commander's plane, a junior high student ran up to me. Then, he took out a piece of paper and started reading out loud. It was something like a resolution of appreciation. He was the representative of a commercial school near Kagoshima Airfield, and I noticed many students from the school, even students from a nearby girls' school, lining up near the apron to welcome us. I was surprised as I thought, who on earth could have known that we were the squadrons responsible for the attack on Pearl Harbor? That should have been a top secret. However, the citizens of Kagoshima City had been watching our extended acrobatic practice before the mission. 
If our preparation had taken place today, there would have been a number of noise pollution lawsuits, with the big complaints arguing that the loud noise was preventing patients from being cured and stopping chickens from laying eggs. And even back then, there was criticism about what the hell they were doing. Recently, naval aviation squadrons are neglecting all military rules. At the wharf during training, the planes buzzed the rooftops while engaged in simulated torpedo launching at low altitudes of 10 metres, aiming at a target in shallow water 500 metres away. It appeared to be sheer madness. Therefore, when they heard the news of the great victory of the Battle of Hawaii, every citizen of Kagoshima guessed our squadrons were involved. That night, among those of us who had returned to Kagoshima base, the governor of Kagoshima prefecture invited the officers to a celebration party, and the mayor of Kagoshima city invited petty officers and sailors to a separate party. While we were drinking that night at a Japanese restaurant called Aoyagi, there was a call from the base with a message ordering Commander Fuchida and Lieutenant Commander Murata to return to the mothership where we were to receive Admiral Yamamoto of the Combined Fleet and the Chief of the General Staff Nagano and others who would visit the Akagi. The message said that if we flew early in the morning from Kagoshima to Iwakuni, they would arrange for a motorboat to pick us up at the Iwakuni base pier. Busan, they sent a troubling message. I said to Murata, he replied, We have no choice. I will fly the plane and the General Commander can sleep in the rear seat. And so it was that the two of us, suffering from hangovers, flew from Kagoshima to the base at Iwakuni and returned to the Akagi aboard the waiting motorboat. The time was already past eleven in the morning. Yamamoto, Nagano and the head of the aviation division, Eikichi Katagiri, were already present and about to propose a toast in the officers' mess. Following a speech by Yamamoto to the commanders of each of the task force fleet's units, and a greeting by Nagano. As we arrived, Murata and I were pulled to the front, where Yamamoto and Nagano greeted us with words of appreciation, followed by another round of toasts, accompanied by chestnuts and squid. On this occasion, Admiral Yamamoto gave me a piece of calligraphy that he had prepared with his writing brush, and he commented that it represented his state of mind regarding the moment. The writing flowed beautifully and read, the thunderous radio broadcast of the attack from the sky of Hawaii, 3,000 nautical miles away. On December 8, 19, the brilliant action of Commander Fuchida Isoroku Yamamoto. Afterwards, Nagano issued an order. On December 26, Commander Fuchida, leader of the first wave air attack, and Lieutenant Commander Shimazaki, commander of the second wave attack, are to report directly to the throne, to His Majesty the Generalissimo, on the battle developments of Pearl Harbor. A report to the throne by officers of commander rank was unprecedented. This was an honor beyond anything that I deserved, and I consulted gender on how to prepare for the presentation. It was decided that I would report on our attack on the ships and Shimazaki on the attack on the air bases, and we would organize our presentations accordingly. I asked Murata to draw a layout of the attack on the ships, and asked Chief Navigation Officer Miura to have his signalman make a good quality copy. The signalman, wearing white gloves as it would be honoured by the Emperor's inspection, produced a fine copy. On December 25th, both Shimazaki and I flew from Kura Aviation Base to Yokosuka Base on a carrier bomber. When we arrived, we were received by Captain Keizo Ueno, commander of the Yokosuka Air Squadrons, and it was only this officer who criticised the battle achievements, his point of criticism was it was not good to have left the enemy aircraft carriers unattached and intact. Now, here was a real naval aviation pro. I quite agreed with him. On December 26th, Shimazaki and I reported to the General Staff Headquarters at 9am, and after a rehearsal at the First Operations Department, went to the palace together with Nagano and Commander Nagumo. We waited for only a short time, and His Majesty appeared, accompanied only by his chief aide-de-camp, Shigeru Hasunuma. Standing directly across from His Majesty, I unfolded the layout in front of him, and pointing with my finger at the relevant places on the battlefield diagram, gave a blow-by-blow -blow description of our battle achievements against the enemy ships. For each topic of discussion, I showed and described to him aerial photographs we had taken. His Majesty looked at the photos with great interest, 
turning them vertically and horizontally. Our allotted time was 30 minutes, but we ended up spending one and a half hours. Following me, Shimazaki reported on the battle development and achievements of the attack on the airbases. When Nagano asked, Are there any more questions? the Emperor responded, Not particularly. However, after a short while, he asked Nagano, Are you bringing these photographs back? Nagano relied. We will have them framed and delivered to place by your side. The Emperor said, The mounting can be done later. I will take them now to show them to the Empress. Thus, the Emperor himself left the room carrying more than a dozen photos. Upon our return from the palace, we were received at the official residence of the Minister of the Navy, where more than a dozen military councillors and leading dignitaries of the Navy were present. There, Shimazaki and I repeated exactly what we reported to the throne just a short time earlier. Prince Fushiminomiya was among the dignitaries, but it was the eldest person in the audience, Admiral Nobumasa Swetsugu, who, more than the others, praised us. The reason was that we had destroyed all the capital ships of the United States Pacific Fleet. This had been the aim of the Japanese Navy for the past 30 years. Adding to his praise, he said he admired me, because you are an ideal example of a warrior. You have not ignored accurate surveillance in analysing your battle achievements. This was really too much praise for me. While I felt like sinking through the floor, regretting that we missed destroying the enemy carriers, here these dozen naval councillors were overjoyed with the sinking of the battleships, offering drinks to me one after another. When I left the celebration party at the official residence and returned to General Staff Headquarters, Prince Takamatsunomiya Nobuhito approached me. The prince was in the same 52nd class with me at the Naval Academy, and he was a member of the General Staff at that time. He told me that he wanted me to tell the story I reported to the throne earlier today, to members of the imperial families, who would be getting together at the Kasumigaseki Detached Palace tomorrow, and I did not have to worry about confidentiality matters as only adults would be attending. This was also the greatest honour. Thus, the next day, on December 27th, we visited the detached palace, where both Shimazaki and I talked on the subject alternately for about an hour and a half from two in the afternoon. Prince Fushiminomiya was hosting the meeting, and His Royal Highness was very considerate to us. I was impressed that Prince Mikasanomiya was taking notes until the very end of our presentation. Following all the events with the royal audiences, Shimazaki and I flew from Yokosuka to Iwakuni base to return to our squadrons. We shared one piece each of Azuki bean yokan, a Japanese jelly confection, from the famous store Taraya, with the crew members to share the honour of the previous days. On December 10, 1941, the Emperor summoned Chief of General Staff Nagano to give him the following benevolent Imperial Rescript. Imperial Rescript, the combined fleet accomplished a great achievement by destroying the enemy fleet and air force in the Hawaii area at the inception of the war. I was deeply pleased by this and wish that both officers and soldiers will exert even more effort to secure great achievements in the future. The Imperial Seal December 10, 1941. In the following year, on February 11, 1942, Commander Yamamoto of the Combined Fleet granted a citation of appreciation to the Special Mini Submarines Attack Unit. The citation read as follows, Citation of Appreciation, Special Attack Unit. On December 8, 1941, in concert with our air squadrons, the Special Attack Unit assailed the United States Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, at the inception of the war, sacrificing themselves and accomplished a great battle achievement. Their deeds of valour that increased the prestige of the loyalty of the men of the Imperial Navy, in and outside the nation. They enhanced the morale of the entire Navy, are recognised as truly outstanding. Therefore, I grant a citation of appreciation. February 11, 1942. Commander of the Combined Fleet, Isoroku Yamamoto. The reason it took so long before this citation of appreciation was granted was that it was customary for the Japanese Navy in those days to issue citations only after confirmation of the battle results. In this context, no one survived from the mini-submarine unit, and the United States side had not announced anything to date regarding any incident involving the mini-submarines. 
Besides, according to information from a third country, presumed to be Sweden, there were rumours that a special mini-submarine crew had been captured and was being held as war prisoners. Given the situation, there was enough reason to delay the issuance of the citation. Nevertheless, it was imperative to recognise these nine crew members as having died in action, though unrepatriated, promoting them by two steps and respecting them as war heroes. It was also important to conduct a state funeral for these nine war heroes in order to enhance the fighting morale of the public in general, and I suspected that this had been the reason to expedite the granting of the citation. Prior to this, I heard that Captain Hanku Sasaki, commander of the Special Attack Unit, submitted a petition to announce ten instead of nine war heroes, the reason being that one remaining crew member, Ensign Kazuo Sakamaki, had been captured only because the fortunes of war turned against him, and there was no difference in his fighting spirit because he had staked his life along with the other nine crew members. The Navy tried to hide the fact that Sakamaki was captured using various means, such as erasing Sakamaki's image from a group photograph of all ten crew members taken before the mission, or erasing his signature from a collection of the group's autographs. However, there were some among the public who thought that the number of war heroes, nine, was peculiar, and to some extent it was like an open secret. On December 26th, when I was in Tokyo for a meeting, Commander Ryunosuke Ariazumi, the staff officer in charge of submarines at Imperial Headquarters, came to see me to sound me out. Commander Fuchida, why don't you give credit for the explosive sinking of the Arizona to the Special Attack Unit? I smiled wryly and answered, We do not necessarily claim credit for each other's achievements, and since the special mini-submarines were engaged in a special attack mission, I personally would very much like to publicly and loudly talk about their contribution, but not with regard to the Arizona. You know what? The Arizona was moored at its post on the east side of Ford Island, and a repair ship called the Vestal was moored next to the Arizona on the outside. Therefore, a torpedo could not possibly have reached the Arizona. If we should announce that it was an instantaneous sinking by a mini-submarine, we will be laughed at around the world. Commander Arizumi was a submarine specialist and senior to me by one year at the Naval Academy. He was a hot-blooded guy who enthusiastically promoted the use of special mini-submarines in the attack on Pearl Harbor from the start, and he seemed to have disliked my comment and went out of the room indignantly. Back then, news photos, brought in through third countries, showed the disastrous sinking scene of the Arizona. They were most appealing as evidence of the achievement by the Special Attack Unit, and they wanted to use them to glorify their nine war heroes. In the end, the story that was concocted gave credit for the instant sinking of the Arizona to the Special Mini-Submarine Attack Unit, and the state funeral for the nine war heroes was carried out on a grand scale amidst jubilation across the entire nation. We were fighting in one place after another in the South at that time, but the mindset of the air squadron crews who overheard this was not without hostility. Everybody knew too well that the instant sinking of the Arizona was the result of an induced explosion caused by an 800-kilogram armour-piercing bomb. This bomb was dropped by the air attack squadron, and it penetrated the Arizona's magazine. Besides, there were 55 flyers killed in action who never returned, and there was no news that they would be promoted to war heroes. Some of the crew members made sarcastic remarks, complaining that the naval authorities might think that there were too many candidates for an elevation to war hero, and that the two-step promotion process must not have much value. In response to these complaints, I told them that the special mini-submarines engaged in the attack had no hope of survival from the beginning. Give the credit for sinking the Arizona to them. As these words of authority came from their general commander, they became quiet about this matter, but it seemed that complaints still remained among the captains and aviation heads at the First Aviation Fleet's command centre. Under these circumstances, a citation of appreciation was granted to the forces that participated in the Battle of Hawaii, even though it was already April 15th, the citation read as follows, Citation of Appreciation, Forces Participating in the Battle of Hawaii. The annihilation of most of the main force of the United States Pacific Fleet and air power in position 
resulting from the fierce attack of the air squadrons on December 8, 1941. By a surprise attack after having advanced a long distance on the naval port of Hawaii at the outset of the war, made an enormous contribution to the following operations. I recognise the deeds of valour as prominent and grant this citation of appreciation. April 15, 1942. Commander of the Combined Fleet, Isoroku Yamamoto. At the sight of this citation, I was rather disturbed by the expression, prominent deeds of valour. The evaluation of our deeds as prominent was below the best evaluation of outstanding. In view of the nature of their mission, I had no objection to the use of outstanding deed of valour for the citation to the Special Mini Submarine Attack Unit. However, if we consider the overall battle results, it was the air squadrons that annihilated the United States Pacific Fleet, and they should be praised without question for their outstanding deeds of valour. Instead, our evaluation was one rank below prominent deeds of valour, and this annoyed me. This happened later, but when I was assigned as the Chief Staff Officer of the 1st Aviation Fleet, Captain Yoshitake Miwa was the Chief of Staff. Since Miwa was on the staff of the Combined Fleet at the beginning of the war, and responsible for determining which units should be given credit for battle achievements, I took advantage of the opportunity to ask him about the story behind the citation of appreciation. Miwa responded to my question by explaining that, as the staff officer in charge of crediting, I drafted outstanding deeds of valour for the citation, but Commander Yamamoto himself downgraded the rank one step and decided on prominent deeds of valour. According to what he said, the reason was that if Commander Nagumo had more aggressively made repeat attacks, there would be no problem with outstanding deeds of valour. However, because Nagumo retreated after one attack, Commander Yamamoto instructed me to write prominent instead. Now, I understood as I suspected, Nagumo's intentions were not in line with those of his boss, Commander Yamamoto. Also, Vice Admiral Matomu Ugaki, Chief of Staff of the Combined Fleet at the time, describes his feelings in his war memoirs. His diary entry of December 7, 1941 states, The telegram that arrived last night said that the task force fleet was taking the first course to return Vial Point and contained the report on the battle results. It gives me the impression of self-satisfied thieves running away after only limited success. With only 30 damaged or lost planes, it is of primary importance to expand our battle achievements as much as possible. Then he mentions that there were opinions among the staff to make them go back to attack Hawaii again. But he gives three reasons for believing it was too late, admitting their opinions to return were totally justifiable, and concludes, if I were the commander, I would encourage my men to expand their battle achievements further until Pearl Harbor is completely destroyed. But I can take care only of my own business, not theirs. Here we can perceive the atmosphere at the command centre of the combined fleet that resulted in the downgrading of credit and appreciation to prominent deeds of valour. Based on this state of affairs, the granting of the citation of appreciation was delayed by four months. Accordingly, the Navy's personnel department delayed the measure to provide the two-step promotions of the 55 flyers killed in action to war heroes. In the end, this did not help to enhance the morale of the Nagumo task force, the main force of the combined fleet. On December 10, 1941, Tokyo time, I lay on the bed in my private room on the Akagi all day as I felt fatigued and was slightly feverish. As the evening wore on, Gender entered my room without knocking, with a big smile on his face. As I rose up on the bed, I found that he came to tell me the jubilant news of the naval battle off Malaya. The news was that 26 Mitsubishi G4M Betty bombers, Type 1 land-based attack bomber, and 59 Mitsubishi G3Ms, Type 96 land-based attack bomber, 85 planes in total of the 22nd Air Squadron that had been deployed in Indochina, had sunk the HMS Prince of Wales, the flagship of the British Eastern Fleet, and her escort battlecruiser, the HMS Repulse. The British ships had sorted from Singapore in an attempt to intercept Japanese army convoys, which were landing on Kotabaru, off the eastern coast of Malaya, near Kwantan. The Prince of Wales was sunk after being hit by five torpedoes and a 500-kilogram bomb.
The Repulse was also sunk after five torpedo hits and a 250 kilogram bomb. However, our damage was limited to three planes. Oh, they did it. I was beside myself with joy. Prince of Wales was the newest unsinkable battleship that was the pride of Britain. The ship gained popularity among the British people based on its engagement with the German battleship Bismarck. I could imagine how discouraged the British people must have been by the unexpected loss of the ship. I said, this should have convinced the leaders of the Japanese Navy of our argument of the non-utility of battleships. To this, Gender did not nod and did not give any indication of agreement. He simply said, I don't know. A man with his sharp mind must have seen through the stubbornness of the Japanese Navy's boneheaded leaders. I happened to see evidence of this after the war. The war memoirs of Rear Admiral Ugaki, who was the chief of staff of the combined fleet when the war broke out, describes his feelings about the role of the battleship and the airplane as follows. I cannot help but confirm the undoubted strength of planes based on developments since last night, December 9th. This brand new battleship that once participated in the sinking of the Bismarck demonstrated unexpectedly weak defensive capabilities. On this basis, the non-utility theory of battleships and the versatility theory of aviation should gather much greater momentum. He repeatedly regrets that the Southern Expeditionary Fleet, which destroyed the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, included two fast battleships under the command of Rear Admiral Ozawa, and surface ships of the Second Fleet in the battle that lasted day and night on December 9th. Interestingly, Ugaki stated in his diary entry of December 16th that, as of today, construction of the Yamato has been completed, and she is scheduled to be officially listed and enrolled in the first squadron. I am pleased with the addition of such great strength. And during the evening of the following day, December 17th, a detailed report on the battle achievements of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor arrived. Seeing the report, Ugaki wrote his impression as follows, This is the grace and help of heaven. We should celebrate this truly excellent battle result. The five, five, three capital ships ratio we have suffered has become quite the opposite now, with the addition of the Yamato. What we failed to achieve by treaty, we have taken by force. Now is the time to let them understand the situation. The twenty years of hardship we have endured have borne fruit for us now. I pay respect to the struggle and efforts of all parties concerned. However, the first strike at Hawaii should have left a deep resentment in their mind. There is no way of knowing what means they might employ as retaliation, whether aircraft carriers or superior air power. We should not let our guard down by any means. Looking at the latter half of his statement, I was almost about to thank Ugaki for his insightful understanding of the power of aviation. However then, as the proverb says, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree, I found the following entry in his diary, dated December 26th. This only reaffirmed his total lack of understanding. There was a communication from Vice Commandant Toshihira Inoguchi of the Gunnery School. After words of congratulations, he lamented that, while he expected a lot and that it was time to witness achievement from our big guns in the naval battle off Malaya, the credit was again taken by the airplanes. He is quite right, but the war is going to be a long affair, and various opportunities should arise ahead. There should be opportunities to fully exert the strength of the big guns of our capital ships. This was the irredeemable big ship big gun policy. In retrospect, I wonder if there was any situation in which the big guns of our battleships exerted their real strength during the Pacific War. Incidentally, Inoguchi of the Naval Gunnery School, the main temple of the big ship big gun policy, was later assigned as captain of the monster battleship Musashi. On the occasion of the Battle of Leyte, Musashi received concentrated and repeated aerial attacks by carrier-based planes from Halsey's task force fleet and he shared his ship's destiny in the Sibuyan Sea. As we have seen, the reasons we lost the Pacific War were already evident in the early stages of the war in the Navy's inability to respond spontaneously to the changing nature of warfare operations. The rapid evolution of air power and the obsession with the big gun policy at the top, as typified by Chief of Staff Ugaki. The eight capital ships of the US Pacific Fleet were destroyed completely by the attack of the 360 carrier-based planes, 
dispatched from six carriers of the Nagumo Task Force fleet. In actual battle, it had been proven that battleships were nothing but floating targets, destined to be sunk in the face of air power. However, stubborn supporters of the battleships insisted that it was an anchored fleet, and besides, they argued, the enemy had let their guard down. Then, when those words were hardly out of their mouths, the Battle of Malaya took place. The pride of the British Navy, HMS Prince of Wales and the battle cruiser, HMS Repulse, were sunk in action while steaming in the open sea. Soon enough, lessons from the battles of Hawaii and off Malaya awakened the United States Navy and prompted it to reconstruct itself based on the creation of grand task force fleets with carriers as the main force. On the other hand, the Imperial Japanese Navy itself was far from being awakened by these same battle lessons, and they were, instead, at odds with air power, continuing to pursue dreams of decisive fleet battles with battleships as the main force. As evidence of their misguided policy, soon after the Nagumo Task Force fleet returned, instead of reinforcing this squadron, the Central Naval Authority started to dismantle the most powerful task force fleet in the world. Specifically, they decided to take out approximately 20% of the carrier crews and reassign them as instructors at training air squadrons for the purpose of the quick training of new air crews in large numbers. There was no argument about the necessity to produce a large number of new air crews. However, during the early days of the war, dismantling the carrier-based air crews of the Nagumo Task Force fleet should have been the last thing on anyone's mind. In the early days of the war, these carrier air crews attained godlike levels of skill, enough to win a world championship if there were one, and not only on the level of individual skills, but also in the emotional bonds forged between senior and junior crews that unified squadrons and created better coordination among the squadrons. This combined strength was the source of the reputation of the Nagumo task fleet as the strongest in the world, and breaking up this combination would require at least another six months of training to rebuild our strength. The war had just started, and I felt outraged that they got the whole thing wrong. If the Central Authority was thoroughly committed to the theory that our main force should be organised around the task force fleet, instructors and trainers could be extracted from different sources. Concurrent with the dismantling of air crews by the Central Authority, the command centre of the combined fleet divided the Nagumo Task Force fleet from one military division into two units. The new units were Carrier Division 5, Shokaku Zuikaku, commanded by Rear Admiral Chuichi Hara, which would remain on the Eastern Front. The Task Force fleet, commanded by Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, comprised of Carrier Division 1, Akagi, Kaga, and Carrier Division 2, Soryu, Hiryu, four carriers in total, to conduct the campaign in the south. I was utterly appalled by their lack of foresight. The combination of six carriers should never have been broken up. Who on earth did the command centre of the combined fleet think the Japanese Navy's main enemy was? It was the United States Navy. That being the case, they should have kept the six-carrier combination intact in order to confront the enemy on the Eastern Front, even enhancing their capacity instead of splitting up the Nagumo task force. It was my belief that if we could wipe out the United States fleet on the Eastern Front, the campaign in the South would fall our way, just like a ripe fruit drops with no effort. My judgment is that the measures taken by the Central Authority and the command centre of the combined fleet to dismantle the Nagumo task force after they returned from Pearl Harbor was the first step in our losing the Pacific War. Ironically, Although the Japanese Navy pioneered the organisational concept of up-to-date task force fleets, they destroyed the concept themselves. In contrast, the United States Navy, which had fallen short in its initiatives, was steadily expediting the creation of a grand task force fleet. In the end, it was the United States Navy, not the Japanese Navy, that expanded the battle achievements of Pearl Harbour. The main focus of the initial battles of the Pacific War as plotted out by Imperial Headquarters, was the operation in the South. The main objective of this operation was the acquisition of strategic materials. It was regarded as indispensable for Japan, which suffered from a scarcity of the strategic materials required to pursue the war effort. 
The air raid on Pearl Harbor was carried out in order to prevent the intervention of the United States Pacific Fleet during the campaign in the South. Both Imperial Headquarters and the Command Center of the Combined Fleet focused on the campaign in the South, which they called the First Stage Operation. Both were totally satisfied with the battle results of Pearl Harbor. Both felt that the threat from the United States Pacific Fleet during the First Stage Operation had been eliminated. Naturally, it was why they decided to divert four carriers from the Nagumo Task Force to the campaign in the South. The initial objective of the campaign was to capture Rabul, a small town in Papua New Guinea. On January 23, 1942, Carrier Division 1, Akagi, Kaga, under the direct command of Vice Admiral Nagumo, advanced to the northeastern sea off New Ireland. They launched an air raid on Rabaul and Kavieng, the capital of New Ireland province. In a separate action, Carrier Division 5, Shokaku, Zuikaku, led by Rear Admiral Hara, launched an air raid on Lai, the capital of Moroe province in Papua New Guinea, and on Salamaua, a nearby town. Our objective was to annihilate the enemy's air power in each area, but it turned out that the enemy did not deploy significant air power at either site. I commanded the air raid on Rabul, leading a combination of fighters and bombers, 90 planes in total. As we arrived in the sky above Rabul, we witnessed two planes taking off, Trying to escape, they were raising a cloud of dust. They were chased by several Zero fighters of the Air Superiority Squadron and were shot down quickly. Afterwards, there was not a single sighting of an enemy plane, either on the ground or in the air, leaving only the large grounds of the second airfield. I was in trouble. Where were we going to drop the bombs we were carrying? It would be detrimental to bombard and destroy the facilities in the area, because our landing forces would occupy and use the facilities as early as tomorrow. If we bombarded private residences, we would create a level of resentment that would hamper our occupation campaign afterwards. However, if we did not drop the bombs before landing on the carriers, landing would be very risky and likely cause accidents. I was at a sheer loss and looked around to search for possible targets. Then I spotted a transport ship in Rabul Bay, since its propeller was moving, the ship obviously was attempting to escape. I signalled the accompanying dive-bombing squadron. Soon, three planes began their diving descent. As soon as we saw smoke from the explosion on the transport ship, it headed towards the beach in an attempt to avoid sinking. I then looked around to see if there was an additional target. There was an active volcano at the entrance of Rabble Bay, and there was a gun battery at the base of the mountain. Seeing it as a potential threat to our landing troops, I ordered the 36-level bombers under my direct command to drop all of the 800-kilogram bombs which they were carrying. After we returned to the Akagi, Lieutenant Furukawa, the squadron commander, asked me, Commander, have you noticed that when the bombs exploded on the gun battery? He added, the volcanic smoke became much thicker. Without thinking, I answered, that can't be. Everybody burst into laughter at Furukawa's joke. Joke or not, I did not understand how the command centre of the combined fleet could deploy the main force of the Japanese Navy in an operation where it was difficult to locate bombing targets. That was like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. I still respected Admiral Yamamoto, but it was around that time that a seed of suspicion was born that Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto might be a mediocre admiral. The Nagumo task force moved towards the north and launched an air raid on the strategic British naval port of Trincomalee, on the island of Ceylon, on April 9, 1942. The formation of the air attack squadron was the same as the attack on Colombo. I led the first wave, 180 planes taking off 30 minutes before sunrise according to our customary practice. The weather was fine. We found two light cruisers, several destroyers, and about a dozen transport vessels at anchor in the port of Trincomalee. On the airfield, approximately 20 planes were lined up on the apron in front of the hangar. They probably had radar, because as we approached Trincomalee, British hurricanes ambushed and intercepted us. Enemy ground fire also commenced quickly. However, our battle achievements were enormous. The Air Superiority Squadron, which had wiped out enemy planes in the air in no time, rushed to the airfield, strafed the planes which were lined up on the ground and set them ablaze. 
the dive bombing squadron eliminated the ships in the port. Meanwhile, the level bombing squadron under my direct command carried 800 kilogram bombs for land targets, and we concentrated our bombing on facilities in the naval shipyard area. Then, probably because of an induced explosion at the ammunition depot, there were continuous explosions that appeared like a spectacular fireworks display. Looking around and seeing that the enemy forces and facilities in Trincomalee had been destroyed completely, I then assembled the Air Superiority Squadron to embark on our return course. As we were heading back, there was a report from our reconnaissance plane of an enemy sighting. One enemy carrier and one destroyer were heading south. I hastened my return. As I arrived on the Akagi, Gender came out of the operations room to tell me. Igusa's second wave bombardment squadron had just left. All escort fighters are up in the air. I want you to go out again, okay? It will be a torpedo attack this time. Then, at the same moment that the command, anti-air battle, blared out, there were the mellow, resonant boom-boom-boom sounds of explosions. As we watched, four bombs dropped on the starboard side, and two bombs dropped on the port side, creating white columns of water, which sandwiched the Akagi's bow. We were being bombarded by enemy planes. With a sigh of relief, both Gender and I looked up at the sky. It was an assault of a six-plane formation of the enemy's heavy bombers. Their altitude was 4,000 metres, and they were Bristol Blenheims of the British Royal Air Force. Our air cover escort fighters chased after the planes. Before long, one of the enemy planes was falling with a tail of fire. Then, another one was engulfed in black smoke. The ensuing air combats became invisible from the Akagi. Our air cover escort fighters continued to chase after the remaining escaping enemy heavy bombers, until all of them had been shot down. However, Lieutenant Sumio Nono, commander of the air cover escort fighter squadron and divisional officer of the Hiryu, never returned. Separately, the reconnaissance plane in contact with the enemy carrier reported that the ship was the Hermes. It also reported that the carrier was accompanied by a destroyer and that there was a large merchant ship nearby. Suddenly, the Akagi's enemy communications team picked up a telephone conversation from the Hermes, frantically calling Trincomalee base. Have the hurricanes launched? Have the hurricanes launched? They were apparently requesting the urgent dispatch of hurricanes, but the hurricanes had been destroyed by our first wave attack. Then a familiar, simple and clear radio command from Igusa came in. Take assault formation. The dive bombing squadron appeared to have spotted the Hermes. A second radio command followed all forces, attack. Akagi's enemy communication team soon reported that the frantic telephone messages had stopped. Then, a short while later, a radio message from Commander Igusa came in. Hermes is inclining to the left. Hermes has been sunk. Cheering broke out on the bridge. Get the destroyer next. The destroyer has been sunk. Get the remaining large merchant ship. The large merchant ship has been sunk. It was really a remarkable battle development, all this happening in only 20 minutes. Besides, we still had more unused cards in our hand. Commander Nagumo decided that the Indian Ocean operation was concluded with the air raid on Trincomalee. The command centre of the combined fleet also agreed and ordered the Nagumo task force to return inland. Thus, the Nagumo task force took the return course inland passing through the Straits of Malacca and heading north to the South China Sea. There, he separated from Rear Admiral Hara's Carrier Division 5, which would resume deployment on the Eastern Front. Sometime later, I was cooling off in a folding chair on the flight deck. The Southern Cross was twinkling low near the horizon. By the following night, we would be parting with that star. I was thinking back on the path taken by the Nagumo task force over the past four months since the start of the war. The distance covered by the Nagumo task force extended 50,000 nautical miles, from Hawaii in the east to Ceylon in the west, from cold wind and raging seas in the north to windless burning heat in the south, with phenomenal battle achievements. Morale could not have been better, and skill levels had matured to the point of matching those of the gods. However, I continued to ponder the question of whether it was right to have deployed the main force of the Japanese Navy, the Nagumo Task Force, for dubious operations. It appears that when the Nagumo Task Force returned from Pearl Harbor, 
Imperial headquarters and the command centre of the combined fleet thought that they were available as a supplementary resource. It was a waste of their capacity to leave them idle, so they tried to use them for the campaign in the south. Once deployed, the task force proved to be useful, and that led to their deployment for operations of secondary significance, one after another. However, I believed that the primary operation was the Eastern Front. It was not that the Nagumo Task Force was an available resource. Rather, they would have been short-handed if the leaders had thought about who the main enemy was. And our main enemy was in the East. What a wasteful squandering of opportunity it was, leaving the United States Navy unattended in the Eastern Front. In order to win the war, as I have always insisted, they should have discarded the antiquated concept of a navy organised around a first and second fleet that won the Battle of the Sea of Japan, and organising instead around a grand task force fleet with the Nagumo task force as the core unit and deploying for grand manoeuvres on the Eastern Front under the direct command of Admiral Yamamoto. Then, the opportunity to clash with the enemy's task force with our overwhelming superiority would have inevitably occurred. I deeply resented the lapse of the four months which had been wasted, loitering. The combined fleet called these first four months from the commencement of the war on December 8, 1941, until completion of the campaign in the South, the first stage operation. However, I wonder what Admiral Yamamoto was doing during this first stage operation. By originating the idea of a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, pushing through the operation in spite of opposition from various fronts. And finally bringing the operation to a successful conclusion, Yamamoto enjoyed a huge reputation as a brilliant admiral, even as a godlike admiral. Starting from his career as Vice Commandant of the Naval Academy's Kasumigara Aviation School, Yamamoto rose through the ranks with experience as captain of the aircraft carrier Akagi. He was the commander of the 1st Air Squadron and head of naval aviation headquarters. He was admired for having nurtured Japan's naval aviation. He was certainly the admiral with the most profound understanding of air power. But to get back to the point, what was Admiral Yamamoto doing during the first stage operation? On December 16, 1941, the super battleship Yamato was commissioned and enrolled in the 1st Squadron of the Combined Fleet. Yamamoto quickly designated the Yamato as the flagship of the combined fleet, moving the Admiral's flag from the Nagato. Naturally, this made perfect sense in the seven seas of the world. Never before had such a mammoth battleship existed. But what came afterward was not commendable. Admiral Yamamoto led groups of people from other battleships on board the Yamato, still referring to them as the main force, and throughout the first stage operation. These battleships remained as an idle force, refusing to move from Hashirajima anchorage in Hiroshima Bay. We carrier pilots, who are fond of gossip, referred to them as the Hashirajima fleet. It was meant to be disparaging, when we overheard that the battleships of Hashirajima fleet were engaged in a fire exercise. We all burst into laughter, because we wondered what targets they would shoot their main guns at. The battleships of the US Pacific fleet were sunk at Pearl Harbor and there were no more opponents to shoot. We all laughed about the situation, as if our battleships were waiting for the US rivals to come back from the bottom of the sea. The battleships of the US Pacific Fleet were sunk and unable to move, so they had no contribution to make to the American Navy's operations. On the other hand, the battleships of the Combined Fleet were unharmed, but refused to move from the safety of Hashirajima Anchorage. While there was a difference between unable to move and refused to move, it made no difference from the perspective of not contributing to our operations. We call it an idle force, and the idle force is what has been most strongly criticised in military strategy from ancient times. Wasn't it the same Admiral Yamamoto who took the initiative of designing the grand strategy to attack Pearl Harbour after a long and perilous journey? Didn't it occur to him to initiate a new strategic design on a much grander scale to create a grand task force fleet with the flagship Yamato in the forefront, with the six carriers of the Nagumo task force as the core of the fleet, escorted by all of the Admiral's battleships, a fleet capable of advancing to the Pacific Ocean, of attacking not only Hawaii, but also the west coast of the mainland United States with prompt and decisive action? 
we might thereby have paralyzed the fighting spirit of the American people. At the time, it all appeared very strange to me that he failed to capitalize on this opportunity.